thank you all very much for joining us um, at the third and last of NEST's um, summer webinar series. I'm Matthew Blackstad and I'm the analysis director uh, at NEST Insight and I'm going to be chairing today's session. Um, now in our series we've been looking at the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the retirement readiness and financial resilience of households and those of you who've been with us for the whole journey will know that we started by looking at the financial well-being of households in the UK um, and how the crisis is exacerbating a lot of existing inequalities here. We then looked at the potential for behavioural interventions last week um, and understood how they can help people potentially build their own wellness uh, and resilience following the crisis. But today we're going to broaden this um, topic and ask how economies around the world are responding to the ongoing crisis and, and see how resilient different systems are um, to this global disruption that we're all experiencing. And to help us tackle what is therefore a really, really big topic, I'm pleased to say that we're joined by two distinguished international speakers. Um, on my uh, left, as I look at myself on screen, uh, is Karen Biddle-Andres, who leads the financial security program at our US partner organization, the Aspen Institute. Uh, Karen's team have been our partners uh, in the, and close collaborators in the work that we've been doing around how to balance the financial preparedness of people both for retirement and for the short term. Um, and we're really pleased that she can join us here today to talk about the current situation in the United States. Then um, Pablo Antonio Nicolas, uh, who is principal economist at the OECD uh, and also leads the private pensions unit there um, on my other side. Um, his team have recently conducted an impressive global survey of policy responses to the crisis. And we're really pleased that he's able to join us here today uh, to speak about that. So you'll be hearing from Karen and Pablo very shortly, uh, and, but I want to start really by thanking them both um, for joining us here um, and sharing their expertise and insights. I really do think this is going to be a fascinating session. So following contributions from, from both these panellists, we'll open this up to a discussion which I'll lead off uh, and I'll also throw that session. open to questions from, from all of you attending. Um, so please do submit these, which you can do through the on-screen question function, which you should see on your screen. We'll feel them will be at three o'clock UK time. Um, and meanwhile, if you'd like to respond to any of the topics we raise, please do tweet about the session using the hashtag, which you should be able to see on screen. So let's get going. And I, I'm just going to kick off by briefly framing the discussion before handing over to our speakers. So as many of you will know, at Nest Insight, we've talked a lot about whether people saving for retirement are also prepared to tackle short-term liquidity shocks. Uh, and we've been working on interventions like automatic emergency savings, sidecar savings, um, things that can help create a better balance between short and long-term uh, priorities that people might have. But the kind of shocks we've been talking about all the way through this, this process have really been the kind of things that happen at the individual level, a washing machine breaking down, a car breaking down, uh, a temporary drop in, in income. I'm wondering these, these kind of storms can of course be really hard for individuals and households, but there are things that many of them can do, not all, but there are things that many can do to help make themselves more prepared for these sorts of things in, in future. But of course the storm that we're all going through now, thanks to coronavirus, is and sustained, and it's landing on us all at the same time. And this raises, I think, new and different questions. And to give just, just one example, which I think we'll be touching on today, there was of course already a really heated debate going on around the world about whether defined contribution savers should be allowed to access their retirement assets when they need them to deal with short-term liquidity shocks. But of course, this question becomes all the more difficult when you talk about potentially a really large number of people all accessing basically the same pot at the same time, at precisely the same moment when asset values may well be depleted because of precisely the same economic shocks that are affecting their own individual household finances. And so. I guess the point being that's only one example, but, but it really raises the point that when you consider these kind of systemic crises, it becomes all the more important to consider not just what individuals can do, but also the systemic policies and interventions that can potentially protect people as well as protecting the system that they're saving within. So Gwen, if you could just move to the next slide, please. Now, our previous session, as I said, was asking how we can make it easier for people to take good choices where those choices are within their control. But of course, for countless households around the world, the current situation is way outside their control. 
Uh, they're depending on the stability of the economies they live in, the responses of their governments, and when it comes to long-term savings, the resilience of the retirement system that they're in to support their long-term needs as well. So in this system, we are going to consider resilience at the level of the household, which represented here on the left-hand side of the slide, but we're going to approach this question by looking at the global level and the system level and asking how resilient different retirement systems are proving to these ongoing events as, as they unfold. We'll be asking what policies can build resilience at the system as well as the individual level, and our speakers are, I'm going to introduce now um, are going to tackle this question from really two, two different but, but I think very relevant angles. So first of all, I'm going to ask Karen to speak about the US experience with a particular focus on the financial well-being of households. Karen's going to start by exploring how the crisis has amplified a number of existing pressures that were already there on US households, and then move on to consider what a more balanced retirement system could look like. And then after that deep dive into one major economy, Pablo will then uh, cast a much wider net, giving us a, a whistle-stop tour uh, of the policy, the retirement policy responses that we're seeing right around the world to the crisis. He's going to share some early findings of the OED studies into these policy responses and draw out some of the points of resilience and vulnerability within systems and then end by making some policy recommendations for the future. So um, I think there's quite a lot we're going to pack in there, but I'm sure our speakers can uh, navigate their way through that um, amply. So I'm going to pass over to Karen now to kick off the presentations. Thank you, Karen. Great. Um, thank you to Matthew and the team at Nest for the opportunity to join. It's always a pleasure to get to be in conversation with all of you. Um, and as Matthew said, I'm going to provide a bit of a, an overview of um, the U.S. retirement system and what we know so far about the way that savers in the United States are faring and what that means for that system. Um, uh, so Karen Andres, I'm the, the Director of Policy and Market Solutions, as well as the Project Director for the Retirement Savings Initiative at the Aspen Institute. And um, when if you're on the next slide, please, I'll just say a bit about the Aspen Institute. Um, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank um, founded in 1949 in the wake of World War II to help prevent another global uh, crisis. Um, and we are one program within that broader Aspen Institute focused on illuminating and solving the most critical financial challenges facing American households. And we aim to make financial security a top priority, a top national priority. Um, and it suddenly has become a very clear top national priority. So this this conversation could not be more timely. Um, on the next slide, I wanted to give you just a level set a bit about uh, what was the state of retirement savings in the US on you know, like March 10th, <laughs> right before the crisis. Um, and as Matthew, and I'm sure Paulo also know, um, it's, uh, it's, it does has not performed as well as other systems in the world. Um, so I, I think there are kind of three buckets of um, of work that we had to do already. One was around lack of access to workplace retirement savings. Another was around account leakage and finding this balance of the right level of liquidity for people to access their money in the, in the case of an emergency versus storing for the future um, and where that's left us in terms of inadequacy. So roughly half of private sector workers in the U.S. lack access to a retirement savings plan at work. So this is a little difficult to calculate, but somewhere on the order of 40 million 50 million workers in the U.S. These are disproportionately um, people who work for small businesses and disproportionately black and brown workers, which contributes, of course, to inequity in the way in the levels of retirement savings and wealth. Um, importantly, our system is already quite a bit more liquid um, than most other systems in the world uh, with people able to take hardship withdrawals, loans that may or may not get repaid, um, and most commonly, people withdrawing the money at job change, right? Because our system is not central. Um, our accounts are provided by an employer. And when you separate service and move from employer to employer, you have the ability to take that money. There's a tax penalty, of course, but um, it doesn't stop an average of somewhere between 1.5 and 2.9% of plan assets leaking out of the system every year. Um, and where that's left us in terms of adequacy is that nearly half of households headed by someone over 55 have no retirement savings, um, which is a pretty, and that, that was before the crisis. So on the next slide, let's talk about where this has all left us, what COVID has done, what we know so far about what's going on with US households. So when we conceptualize financial security at the household level, we think there are three components. There's cash flow, which you need to be routinely positive 
on a routine basis, your income must exceed your expenses. That supports your ability to build up personal resources. These are emergency savings, retirement savings, other forms of savings, et cetera. Um, and then both of these are supported by a set of public and private benefits. So just on the routinely cash flow side, you can see some of the latest statistics. We have 51 million who filed unemployment claims. A quarter of those think they're likely to lose that job completely in the next year. We have 87, I mean, numbers are staggering, millions of people who are having trouble paying credit card debt. The average American has cut back on debt payments by $400 a month. It does not bode well for when this crisis ends. Um, on where that has left people on the personal resource side um, is that you have people depleting emergency savings as one might assume, um, people increasing, especially low and moderate income Americans, increasing their use of credit. Um, and for the purposes of this conversation, we have two in five I'm afraid I think Karen has, um, has frozen there. Um, just going to give her a couple of moments to return. And if it's going to take more than a couple of moments, Pablo, I might ask to uh, hand over a little bit early to you if that's all right. Yeah. I think we're. Uh, I think we're going to need to wait for Karen to come back on again. Gwen, would you mind forwarding to Pablo's title slide so we can maybe just jump ahead to his presentation and then and then we can return to this, this slide eight uh, when we get Karen back. What a shame. So, Pablo, I'm going to ask you to step in now if that's all right. Slight, slightly earlier than planned, and uh, yeah, we're really looking forward to hearing your your the results of your findings and and your policy recommendations. Okay, this this is all right. Uh, just. Uh... It's a shame because it was very interesting what Karen was talking about, and it was a great compliment to what I'm going to be talking about. But um, uh, so let me just uh, start with um, thanking you for the invitation. And what we have done at the o at the OECD is to to look at what retirement savings are doing uh, in the time of COVID-19, and to address you, the question of of this seminar series, building resilience. First. I'm going to talk about the challenges. Second, I'm going to highlight what many countries have done. And third, I will uh, make a few messages. And obviously, these policy messages that we present are the result of looking and focusing on the international experiences. And that's how we bring these ideas of how to build the resilience. So in the following slides, I highlight the, the six main challenges that retirement savings are facing. Next slide, please. Um, so we can see that the first one that all retirement saving arrangements around the world face was a large decrease in the value of assets, in particular in, in February and March, uh, from fa falling uh, financial markets. At the same time, there was an increase in liability and an increase in the solvency problems from falling interest rates in retirement savings arrangements that involve income promises, what normally they call defined benefits or life annuity products provided by generally insurance companies. As long as there is a promise, there is a liability and there is a solvency problem that might get worse if interest rates are falling because interest rates basically is the value of the future liabilities evalu evaluated today. As the crisis or the COVID-19 pandemic went on, uh, we started to realize, and this is something that will continue going on during the autumn, as Matthew has highlighted, that there is a lower, much lower capability to contribute to retirement saving plans from individuals, because most people are seeing their wages and their income reduced, but also a lot of people are losing their jobs. And Karen was already talking about that in the case of the US. We know that many OECD countries follow and special unemployment programs are, are 
solving this problem to a degree, but as Matthew say, going forward, that might not continue for forever. And also there is a, a, a lower capability to contribute from employers or from the state because they are facing financial distress. Additionally to these three, we uh, also have noticed uh, by talking and assessing uh, regulators, supervisors, and other players in the pension system, like pension funds, that there has been a lot of operational disruptions as a result of working remotely, and we are experiencing one of them uh, today as we are having this type of webinars uh, remotely. Uh, also, uh, you probably have seen in the press uh, a lot of cyber attacks, frauds, and scams that have been directed not only to individuals, also to regulators, to supervisors, and also to pension funds. And this is quite important because uh, it can lead to, to serious problems in retirement savings. And this is one of the issues, the operational disruption and the cyber attacks and frauds and scam that requires to build a resilience quite quickly. Finally, and this is one of the issues that Matthew highlights at the end, uh, there has been short-term measures, but that have long-term consequences. So the, one of the challenges is that countries have started to put in place uh, measures that aim at providing relief in the short term, but we do believe that some of them can have large negative impact in the long term, especially on retirement income adequacy measures like contribution holidays and early access to retirement savings. And this is uh, quite important, as Matthew highlighted, is one of the, the discussion that is going on now in many countries, and it will continue going on for the months to come. In Australia, for example, they are starting to, to discuss whether to extend these measures going forward. And in Chile, for example, last week they just approved this, uh, this type of measures to access uh, retirement saving pots. But there is going on in many countries, and as Karen was explaining, was also uh, the case in, 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 in the US, but uh, she's back with us, so uh, it, she will pick up afterwards. Uh, the next slide, please, shows um, an infographic. This is the new terminology. Uh, about the different main policy responses that countries have implemented. Uh, in these slides, we can see the six uh, challenges with an example of the um, type of measures implemented in each of the six and the countries that have implemented measures. I'm not going to go into detail uh, in order to allow for time for discussion. So by looking at these challenges and then at the, at the measures that different countries have implemented, we have realized that there are very important messages to put forward in order to build resilience in retirement saving plans. <clears throat> so in the next slides, I start highlighting these messages. So we argue that the, the first most important is that policymakers should make sure that people saving for retirement stay the course. What do we mean by this? Well, same for retirement is for the long term. So maintaining the investment in retirement portfolios to avoid selling and materializing losses is very important. We saw that one of the main uh, challenges is, was the loss of the, of the value of the saving, retirement saving portfolios during, during the first quarter of the year. We have seen a recovery in Q2. We don't know what will happen in Q3 or Q4 because the, the uncertainty going forward is quite high. But if we look back at the financial and economic crisis, we see that not selling and not materializing the losses is the way to go unless you need it. And we'll get into that later on. Also, we have seen that many countries have implemented programs, transfers programs, subs subsidy programs, subsidizing income, special unemployment programs, furlough programs. Even in the US, Karen uh, was going to, to guide that in the US. And these programs are essential because what they are doing is people are not suffering as much as income loss and they might continue to contribute to the retirement saving pots and they will be able to build 
uh, retirement pots that will um, grant them a, a type of retirement that they were planning before. Most OECD countries have implemented these type of programs. Obviously, as Matthew say, there are a lot of discussions going on in many countries and in the US, I think this week the Congress is already talking about this to extend them. But in many countries, they have extended them to September or to October. And these programs are quite important to, to make sure that people continue contributing, that the, the, the employers and the state continue contributing, and retirement savings are keep building up. In the next slides, please, uh, we present main guidelines uh, that we believe are important for policymakers, regulators, and supervisors. And they are more linked to, to the type of pension plans in which, or retirement saving arrangements in which there are uh, promises, like defined benefits and life annuity products. Uh, first, it's very important that regulators and policymakers allow for flexibility in recovery plans to address funding problems, because this is a big shock, a system-wide shock, as Matthew called it, and uh, the, the regulation has to adjust to the shock and not force pension funds and uh, employers to take measures that uh, might make things even worse. Obviously, it's very important that once the shock is over, uh, these measures are reversed because the exceptionality is over. In previous shocks, like the financial and economic crisis, uh, sometimes these exceptional measures were not remove and we highlight that it's important to remove. It's also very important that regulators and policymakers make sure that funding and solvency rules for DB plans are contracyclical and introducing flexibility in meeting these funding requirements will work uh, uh, to a large extent. And obviously provide proportionate, flexible and risk-based supervision of its oversight coupled with adequate communication to reduce fraud and to facilitate efficient operations to address these issues of uh, uh, disruptions. And the final slide, well, no, the one, the slide before the final, present the, one of the issues that Matthew has been highlighting. And I also highlight one of the key challenges, uh, meaning countries have implemented uh, policy measures with the goal of providing short-term relief. In the next slide, please, we can see them, uh, these messages. So we believe and that these measures, might, some of them might have a very important negative impact in the long term. So we argue that it's very important to allow, next slide, please, allow access to retirement savings, but only as a measure of last resort. And most importantly, it should always be based on individual specific exceptional circumstances, what in the jargon call, they call hardship circumstances. Because at the end of the day, retirement pots are to finance retirement. And accessing these retirement pots could lead to materialization of the temporary asset value losses. It could lead to liquidity problems here, I refer to liquidity from a different angle than Matthew. Liquidity in the sense that pension funds do invest in illiquid assets to a large extent because it's long-term investment for retirement and might not have the type of liquidity that is required when people in, in, a large, uh, in large masses can access this. So it creates a liquidity problem in the system and also investment management problems to pension funds. But obviously for us, what is more important is before COVID-19, we were already talking about adequacy shortfalls in retirement. So if people start accessing this, uh, their retirement savings, the adequacy shortfalls are going to be much, much worse. Obviously we do understand that some people might need to access them. So that's why we argue that in some regulatory frameworks, there are already measures and exceptions for hardship of special circumstances for people to access the retirement savings. And this is the type of measures that should be in place for people 
that really are not covered by this uh, state aid programs or unemployment or furlough programs uh, to help them with their income shortfall as, as a result of COVID-19, then they can access. But it should be based on a specific individual exceptional circumstances. This is essential. And in the last slide, next slide, please, I want to throw to the audience some ideas of what we are thinking that is some of the issues will, well, they will be, we will be discussing around the world in the months to come. First, there are calls about how best to invest assets earmarked for retirement to assist on the recovery, including infrastructure investment, ESG technology develop, developments. So we can discuss about that later on during the Q&A. Also, uh, the use of retirement pods, as I mentioned. And finally, a discussion for all those plans that uh, have promises uh, about mortality and life expectancy, liabilities and mortality tables because there um, one can, mortality has increased, life expectancy might be adjusting. There is a lot of discussion coming up and it's already something that you can see in the press in countries like the UK or the Netherlands. So I leave it here and I pass on the baton to Karen. Thank you. Um, we're having them all today. Um, thank you very much, Pablo, and especially for stepping in at, uh, at rather short notice there. Um, Karen, do we have you back? Because you're looking a bit frozen now at the moment to me. No, I fear our problems are continuing. So, um, Pablo, what I might do is start throwing some discussion topics at you, if that's all right, and then we can ask Karen to pick up when, when she returns. Hopefully she will. Um, so I started out by making the distinction between sort of individual level issues, which in many cases individuals can prepare for, and comparing those to these sorts of system-wide challenges like a, a global pandemic. Um, and, um, and I guess the question here is, can we ever really, as systems, be prepared for events like this? I mean, we, we all keep hearing that this event is unprecedented. It's one of the most commonly used words, I think, in, in uh, Google word search at the moment. Um, so what, what can systems do to prepare for things which are, by definition, unknown? Or is this always reactive? Well, obviously, this kind of large shock like COVID-19, uh, there are certain measures that has to be always reactive. So system are not going to be prepared, like the type of measures that Karen was discussing in the US, but I also discuss around the world of subsidizing uh, income and employment, special unemployment programs and for low programs. Those will always be reactive, but having them in place, it's important. Like I was saying, in terms of accent spot, one thing we have noticed is some countries didn't have exceptional circumstances in the regulatory framework to access the pods. So when the crisis came and some of the people didn't got, they, they, despite having all these uh, special unemployment programs, they saw a, a sharp fall in their income, they wanted to access their their, their pods. And then, of course, it, it became a cry against this type of systems because why cannot we access? Other countries had this type of exceptional circumstances in the legislation, in the regulatory framework. So there was not a cry against the system and people could go and access always, as I say in the presentation, based on exceptional, personal, individualized circumstances. That's one thing. The other issues is, well, when you have shocks, you're always going to have large fall in the value of assets and increasing liability and solvency problems. So systems can have 
or retirement saving system can have in the regulatory framework a specific uh, legislation for exceptional circumstances to allow for extra flexibility to deal with these changes. So yes, some things will be reactive, but some things can be in the legislation to address these type of problems where they come. Obviously, new problems will bring always new things that will have to be reactive to. I think we have Karen back. And, and of course, it's from what you're saying, it's also, it's, we do, yes, I'm about to hand over. I was just going to say, um, it, it's also the, 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 the ability of a legislature to respond nimbly to these situations is clearly a big part of that, that ability to but, be reactive but, but from what you're saying. It, it is, Karen, you're with us. I mean, let me add one thing, if I may. It is important that they put all these things in the legislation. And one final thing that uh, is quite important is, regulators and policymakers should really start to communicate better to individuals what saving for retirement is about. Less technical jargon right. and what is all this about. I think at Nest we can wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. Karen, you seem to be with us. Would you like to pick up again halfway through? Karen, are you are you hearing me? No, it looks like it looks like there's still some problem at her end, unfortunately. Pablo, I'm going to continue to ask you a few questions, if that's all right. Well, while, while we try to resolve I'm this, um, but we to. we may have to reconvene at another point for for the benefit of getting Karen on board. Um, so uh, another point that you touched on briefly towards the end, Pablo, was the fact that I think, I mean, certainly it's the case in the UK, we recognise that there are measures that have been in place that have, to a very large extent, buffered the impact on individuals, particularly our furlough scheme here, and the fact that that scheme has supported retirement contributions for workers. But these things are coming to an end. And we also recognise that the situation may may well worsen and be quite sustained in many economies. So how do you envisage things changing going forward from what you've seen of the situation to date? And I guess more generally, to what extent should and must um, state safety nets continue to play a role um, versus private actors in continuing to weather what might be really quite a sustained? Uh, obviously, state safety nets will always have to play an essential role in all of this because as you know even in countries like uh, the uk where retirement savings are an important component of retirement income you still have the state pension and that puts a floor to everybody not to fall below certain level of a well-being that uh, different societies decide by themselves. So that part of the safety net is essential. Then we can start the discussion of how far governments can go in subsidizing unemployment and income during these special times. Obviously here there are two things. Some people argue that the COVID-19, the impact of COVID-19 uh, in, in the economy uh, is limited in time until we find a vaccine. But of course, for certain sectors, it might not be that limited in time, like aviation and, and leisure and all those kind of sectors. So there are a lot of discussion going now that some kind of restructuring of this assistance towards uh, the, the type of economy that we might be developing to be more resilient for this type of shocks going forward will be quite important. Obviously, I don't work directly on that area, but uh, that uh, will affect retirement savings to a large extent. But at the end of the day, the floor for people well-being at retirement will always have to be provided by the state. And, and this, this leads on actually to a question that we've had from, from one of our attendees, uh, which is directed towards you. So I think I'll throw this in now. The question is, do, do governments around the world need to rethink their approach to spend? 
Many countries have significant debt and essentially promote debt in order to drive growth. Should there be a greater need for governments and the person on the street to improve their day-to-day -day savings in order to enable them to save for retirement? Well, at the end of the day, this is uh, the key thing in microeconomics. Uh, income is consumed or is safe. Uh, if you consume it, you have a, a short-term impact on, on growth. If you save it and it's invested adequately, you have productivity and economic growth coming forward in the future. So a balance between the two is extremely important. And uh, the, the structure of the economy of, of each country uh, will determine that balance but uh, both are, in, are important and with respect to to government uh, debt and also to people's savings uh, it's also true that before COVID-19 we were in a, in a world of low growth low interest rates and low returns so say savings uh, to achieve the same accumulating assets to finance your retirement uh, needed to increase because the same amount of savings didn't reach the same given that world. And obviously COVID-19 might have exacerbated that world to a large extent or might not change it at all. So that problem will continue to be there. And that was a discussion we had before and will continue having after COVID-19. Of course, of course. Thank you, Paolo. And, and, and Karen, it's good to see you back through quite a complicated set of telephone wires. I think there must be sharks eating the cable and the Atlantic that's connecting us, but we very much hope now we have your voice as well as your image. And would you like to pick up with, um, with the middle of your presentation? I, I would, and I'm so sorry. And isn't this a microcosm right now for sort of the, um, the very obvious failures of some of the US systems, if we can just sort of <laughs> be honest? Um, so I did catch, in between trying to dial in, I did catch um, Pablo's remarks, and I feel like this actually jumps back in, right? I mean, the fundamental question here is, in a moment where people are are really, really challenged, um, you know, what are the exceptions we should make for retirement savings withdrawals and access? And it feels like, if you go to the next slide, you know, we now have millions of people in the U.S. in an exceptional situation. Um, so I believe the next slide is around, um, I think it's government action, kind of where, what the, t the steps that we've taken, uh, our government has taken to support household financial security, recognizing that fundamental connection between the day-to-day -day financial stability and health of a household and their ability to prepare for the long term. So, right, uh, we just had last week, or earlier, uh, five days ago, uh, a, a moratorium on rent that has shielded one third of renters that has expired. There's also a patchwork, you know, every state, all the 50 states have different versions of this, protecting different sort of um, categories of homeowners and renters. Um, I, I know that a big part of Pablo's presentation was around this support that governments have been giving to their, to their residents and citizens. We've had an expansion of our unemployment insurance by $600 a week. That will expire in two days. And right now there are conversations in Congress about what the next version of that should look like. It, it doesn't look at this point as if um, an extension of that $600 a week will will be in the cards. It's, the Republicans have proposed $200 a week, so still um, proposing some support, but a substantial reduction. Unfortunately, that would happen at the same time that you would see rent uh, moratoria expire and that the forbearance on federal student loan debt payment would also expire on September 30th. So we have a number of you know, income shocks and expense shocks about to happen at the same and wrong time for millions of American households. The, uh, the CARES Act further opened up American retirement savings. Um, you know, I said before, it was, it was already quite a liquid system, and now we have opened up um, withdrawals for up to, to $100,000 eliminating the tax penalty and stretching out um, tax payments across three years. There is the ability to repay the withdrawal, um, but uh, we'll see if that happens. On the next slide, we'll show you, or I'll show you what we know so far. The thing is, it's really early days for this. Um, 
because a lot of the uh, record keepers in our system, you know, there's been a rollout period to begin to even allow the system to withdraw money on that scale. What is the communication program with participants? Uh, so here's what we know so far. Um, Vanguard published some data recently that showed that at least in the first two months after the CARES Act was passed, um, around just under 2% of participants had withdrawn funds. Um, that doesn't sound too bad, uh, but unfortunately the median withdrawal was over $10,000 um, and the participants who took a withdrawal, that was an average of 60% of their balance. Um, and that was in the first two months after the CARES Act was passed. I think we're all sort of holding our breath, waiting to see what happens in the months that follow. Um, and remember, this is for people who had retirement savings um, in the U.S. Uh, we are seeing some companies uh, re suspending or reducing their match. Um, it's worth noting that in the financial crisis, about, I think, 18% of companies reduced or eliminated their matches, and a quarter of those, I believe, never reinstated it at the full level after the recovery. Um, importantly, uh, Social Security. Um, you may know that our, our system has been um, underfunded, and we are, um, pre-COVID, we had been facing an, uh, an insolvency date in the year 2035. Um, and because of the reduced payroll taxes, that insolvency date has gotten closer and estimates range from four to seven years. So we're seeing impacts to retirement savings potentially on both the private savings side as well as, as social security as sort of that pillar one of the, of the retirement system. Next slide, please. So that was a lot of doom and gloom. Things seem bad. And I will tell you from where I sit as an American, uh, it feels bad <laughs> on a lot of levels. Uh, I think we're all aware that the public health crisis um, and the economic crisis or the, the public health recovery and the, and the economic recovery are going hand in hand. And at the moment, neither of those look like they're going in the right direction. Um, that said, um, there will be an end to this at some point. And I think what we have seen, um, not only um, in the in the household economic crisis, but also in you know you may be aware that in the United States we're going through a really deep moment of conversation and reflection and introspection about racial equity um, that was sparked by the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and many others all in quick succession. And I think um, I think what we have in front of us are is an opportunity to build back a better system. Um, that works for people, that prepares them, that leaves them financially secure, and that is reparative, um, that the, the damage that's been done to black households and the wealth gap in particular can, can begin to be addressed. So there are three things that come to mind as we take an optimistic sort of lens to this crisis. One is that I think we are, we're all pretty confident that emergency savings will be depleted, but we also know that, um, that data, historical data after a pandemic shows that there is actually an increased desire among households to rebuild emergency savings. Um, and so we think this, this only reinforces what we have believed, which is that retirement savings systems need to build tools to help people automatically save for emergencies while they save for retirement to, to reduce the, the need to tap into those long-term funds, which as Pablo rightly points out, are best left where they are to grow for the long-term. I think we're, we're unsure right now what the scale of the economic damage will be. Um, uh, but it is certain that there will be damage to small and mid-sized companies in terms of, you know, how many of them even survive this. Um, job losses, some percentage of these, you know, we, we're optimistic that many will come back, but many won't. Um, there, if the, the Great Recession is any indication, reduced matches uh, could, could be a feature for some people in their retirement savings plan at work, and account withdrawals. All of this together means that there will likely be more Americans um, than before who did not have sufficient retirement savings. So we think this opens up an opportunity to revisit the best role of the employer. What is the role of the employer in our system? And how do we make sure that everyone has access um, to workplace retirement savings plan, in particular automatic enrollment, which we've seen from around the world uh, works really well um, when it's implemented and when everyone has access to it. Um, and then as I said at the top, you know, right now we have a white to black wealth gap of 10 to 1. Uh, and that's for a lot of reasons. Um, a lot of a lot of systems that have produced uh, disparate racial outcomes, if not systems that have racist policies built into them. Um, but I think retirement savings has an opportunity to help close that gap. Um, and so I think we're uh, we as we think about where we go from here, uh, how do we take advantage of this sort of sh this light that has been 
projected onto the, the, the financial woes of Americans um, and build back something that works better for everybody in, in the United States. Thanks. Thank you so much, Karen, uh, and uh, thank you particularly for your valiant efforts to break your way back into uh, your little uh, video rectangle there with with audio as well. It's uh, it's it's great that we managed to get through that, particularly uh, because of uh, the very positive note that your presentation ended on. Um, so we were already, as I'm sure you'll have gathered, doing a, a Q and A with, with Pablo, and we started to field a few a few questions, but. I'm going to throw one in now, which is, is a topic I, we've all three of us talked about at, at some point um, during this uh, this discussion, which is around the idea of giving people in particularly defined contribution systems access to their savings. And Karen, you've you've, you've talked about the fact that you know we're, we're at the early stages of that, but there's already a sort of movement in that direction, and obviously a legislative um, intervention of the kind that Pablo was discussing to uh, to enable that. I guess, you know, it, obviously in an ideal world, we all know it would be great if all households had sufficient emergency resources or sufficient safety net to draw on. They didn't need to draw on their retirement pots, but clearly these are exceptional circumstances. I guess I guess the interesting question that this raises, though, is when does the point come where a system should open up, where a DC system should open up, given all the negative impacts that we've talked about? And in particular, who decides? Because at the moment, it's a, as, as Pablo has talked about, it's a patchwork of different forms of state intervention or, or easements or existing systems that have created the openings. And then it's very much left to the individual to, to decide whether to withdraw and how much to withdraw. But, but is, there a, is there a way in which a system could better build in that decision and, and support people when they genuinely need it? Or, or is that not something that the defined contribution system should, should in fact be doing? Karen, do you want to kick off with that? Sure. You know, obviously I'm not going to pretend to have the answer of when is when is the moment, right? It seems inevitable that we're looking, you know, we're basically looking for big pools of capital. Where are the big pools of capital that are that are even accessible? And um, you know, I think in our in our system we have in some ways you have to open this money up, right? Um, given given the dire financial straits that many Americans were all already in. I didn't go into all that in the beginning, you know, but, you know, we already have like some 57% of Americans who are already financially unhealthy. This is not a group of people who are doing well financially on average and just don't save for retirement. I mean, this is, this is, we have, you know, high debt levels and insufficient wages and, you know, we're, this is not a, a nation that is financially healthy on average. We are the wealthiest in the world, but not the healthiest. And so, you know, I think in some ways it, it, it needed to happen right now just to protect people, especially given we're not, you know, as, as I mentioned before, we're not seeing our government um, continue the support. Uh, it doesn't look likely that we will be continuing that cash support that has been so critical in, in keeping people from tapping into those, those long-term resources. So um, I think, you know, as we, I'm, I'm I'm interested in particular in the Australian example. They have opened up to the extent that they have. Um, I'm, you know, they, that that's sort of a, a, to me, a little bit of a surprising move given the, the, the healthier state of their nation. Um, and I'm interested to see what happens with that. I, I think ours was inevitable. It seemed like the, in some ways the right call for who we are. I'm not certain it's the optimal thing if our whole system were working as it should. If I may, well, thank you. Uh, I, 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 th I think there are two things here. Uh, one is now, and I do believe that, as I say before, uh, they should be based on exceptional circumstances. And you ask what should be those circumstances? Well, first, a big loss of income or unemployment, uh, despite those state uh, finance assistance programs that we have been talking about. So obviously, at one point, some people might need to access, but it should be based on those circumstances if there is not the state assistance. Uh, but going forward, there is one country out there that has a very interesting approach, but this is going forward to make the system more resilient tomorrow. Basically, the idea is you contribute X percent to your long-term retirement, uh, to your long-term, and 
you divide that contribution to, to long-term savings into three accounts. One account is housing and health. The other account is, well, you can call it, um, I, I, I call it a rainy day, but emergency savings. You can call it that way. And the third account is retirement savings. So what happened? When you have a shock like this, you have three pots of money and one of them is actually to finance this type of circumstances. And then you have the third one for health and housing, or the first one in the order I mentioned them. And if nothing happens, the day you retire, the three pots are put together and that will finance your retirement. Obviously, uh, in the case of these countries, that means that contribution rates have to be higher. It cannot be 4% or 8% as is in the UK, depending on the stage of the auto-enrollment system. It cannot be like 10% like this in Australia, Chile, or 8% in Mexico, because it doesn't give for that much. But it can be at the, at the level of some of the European or Japanese uh, systems in which uh, the contribution rates are around 20, 25%. But this idea of having these three accounts to build resilience going forward seems something that we should be thinking about. Obviously, uh, we need to study uh, the pros and cons, but it's a good idea. You know, there's actually yeah, a well, discussion I, I about get, that. There are a lot of thoughts here. <laughs> So I was just going to say that's so interesting, Pablo, because there's a little bit of a bubble up of discussion in the in the United States about that. I mean, the I, you know, right now, the most progressive uh, retirement plan systems in, you know, like let's just take Nest, for example, you've got somebody saving a small pot, very small, really, you know, a thousand pounds or something. I, I forget what your threshold is, but, you know, and versus hundreds of thousands, ideally over in the retirement pot. But there's a lot in between a thousand and a hundred thousand dollars in terms of life needs. Um, and in fact, we've heard some rumbling in the U.S. that, you know, what if you could envision a platform that was just your savings platform that had emergency, that had your, in the U.S., your college savings for your children, and uh, you have maybe a, a goal-based, you know, your, your, your health savings account, right? An HSA already exists in the U.S., not available widely, but, you know, to everyone. But, you know, you can imagine a lineup of these different uses and purposes with different tax treatments and even different investment strategies to kind of get at what Pablo is saying. And, um you know, we actually used to have, there is a version of this, an old cafeteria plan in the U.S. that kind of started to go in that direction. So I, th I think the question, though, too, is how big of a shock can you really expect people to absorb, you know, even in that housing and health yeah. account? You know, this strikes me as a crisis that was really that, that social insurance, societal insurance is really purpose built for. This is not this is very much, we hope, an anomaly unless climate change gets wildly out of control and worse. Um, and those kinds of shocks happen on a more regular basis. But I think, you know, what we're wrestling with is certainly people should, I don't think people can self-insure against a sh um, this many months of income loss um, in a crisis, in this kind of a crisis. But maybe there is a role, as Pablo says, for a system that allows for multiple different kinds of savings, not just emergency or retirement. No, yeah, I, thank, I, thank I, I agree. I, I agree that it should always be the state in this kind of shocks that, is, uh, it, it, it takes the, the bigger role in assisting people. But these arrangements will allow people that, uh, for whatever reason, do not have, uh, despite the state assistance, have a big loss of, of yeah. income or, or lose employment, uh, to tap into it. But at the end of the that, day, that, this kind of system-wide shocks needs the state to, to be the final backbone support. Apologies for cutting in. It's just, just we're running a bit short of time. And you, you both rather brilliantly there brought, brought us back full circle because it, it, it comes back to that question about the difference between preparing for household level shocks and, and, and what, what you need to do system wide. So uh, apologies to those who've submitted questions that I'm afraid we, we don't have time for anymore. I hope you'll understand that our little operational dis um, disruptions that we've experienced made it a little difficult to get to everyone's questions. But um, uh, great, great to see the engagement there. It, it's it's very much a, 
I, I was just, just trying to imagine, we, we, we did this series of seminars to replace what would normally be our summer conference in London, and the idea that we would have invited Karen over and she'd be sitting on stage and then suddenly vanish from her chair halfway through um, is a bit unimaginable, but these are the days we're living in, and I, we're really, really grateful to both of you, Karen, for finding your way back in by any means, and, and Pablo for, for, for jumping in, because that ended up being a really good discussion, and um, very grateful to you both. Um, do either of you want to refer our attendees to anywhere where they can go to get any further information? Well, all all the information I I presented uh, it's in the OECD webpage on the hub about COVID nineteen. It might not be easy to find, but if anybody uh, contact me directly, I will be happy to to send them the information. Thank you, Pablo and Karen. Presumably to the Financial Security Program website. Uh, yeah, so on um, on the, the Aspen Institute Financial Security Program website, um, we, we publish a lot of the, the work that we do in retirement, and in a, in a month or two, we'll be publishing sort of a comprehensive report um, of, of what we think the, what are kind of the, the priorities um, uh, for the U.S. retirement system and the design principles that we would like to uh, that we would like to see um, a different system sort of meet. Um, so we, we would love to have you join us there on our website and newsletter. Thank you very much. And, and thank you again, both of you, for some really informed and stimulating contributions there and for what, what became a very good discussion in spite of gaps. Um, and um, thank you as well to all of the people who've attended not just this, but the previous two webinars. I hope you found them interesting. Uh, if you didn't see uh, either the previous two or you missed any of this one, these will be available uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, I don't know if we're going to try and re-edit this one, Karen, to put you back in order, but um, let's, see what, let's see what we can do with the raw material. And um, for now, I'm just going to say thank you all very much, and we look forward to seeing you all at future events. Bye for now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.